Okay, so I am Giovanni Emanuele Corazza, professor at the University of Bologna. I'm the president of uh, Fondazione Guglielmo Marconi, this entity to remember Marconi, the inventor of radio. Um, University of Bologna and Fondazione Marconi together founded this uh, Marconi Institute for Creativity. It's a unique place in the world where you can see where an invention was born, an invention that changed the course of our societies. So please come and use it for your next script. And as you have seen through these uh, days, creativity can be tackled at different levels. The most fundamental one is what happens in the brain as we are thinking in a creative way, so the neural correlates to creative thinking. Then we have creative cognition and the behavior of the individual, but not only the individual by himself or herself, the teamwork, and it's not to be taken for granted that people working together are more creative than people alone, because it depends very much on the dynamics and the relationships that are installed between the group. There are many, many open questions, more open questions than closed. And finally, there's a cosmological level of creativity. And what Be does that mean? What does that mean? Uh -huh. There are an indefinite number of particles in the universe, and they all come together in a single unity, instant by instant. And this is a creative act. So creativity is the ultimate principle of metaphysics. It's not only a human quality. Is something that is driving the evolution of our universe from the Big Bang on. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm oh. just going to talk about humans <laughs> today. Uh, so we've talked about the right hemisphere, left hemisphere. That is, uh, as uh, Mencken said, it's an easy answer to a very complex problem, but unfortunately it's wrong. When we think creatively, both hemispheres are involved. That does not mean that they do the same thing. So there is lateralization, different functions in the right and left hemisphere. But one thing that has come out very clearly in the last few years is that the connectivity between the two is the key. Mm. So more than what structure is active at any time is how fast and how well they communicate. You might think, is this something that you're born with or is it something that you learn to be creative? and to have this connectivity. The fact is that when we are born, all of our organs are complete and they function perfectly as they will when we are adult, with one exception, the brain. Mm. The brain is incomplete when we are born. Mm. Why? Because we, have, uh, we are super rich in neurons and super poor in synapses, in connections, when we are born. So in the first two years of our life, we have this phenomenon which is called synaptogenesis, an explosion of connections. And we have the peak of connectivity when we are two years old. After that age, we start to have memories, experiences, we learn. And those connections that are confirmed by experience, they, they become thicker, they become stronger, more brilliant, faster. And the ones that we don't use, we prune them away. They are lost. So our brains are shaped by experience. So nothing is completely genetic and nothing is completely experiential. It's always biocultural or epigenetic. What is it we're seeing? We are I mean, seeing exactly. the connections, the synapses between the neurons as they grow from when you're born to up to two years. And then you see when you're an adult, you have less synapses, but they are thicker. But is this an animation or is it, a, is it kind of it's a an drawing. interpretation? It's a drawing that's an interpretation of... What happens in the yeah, brain. So, yeah. so those points are, are the neurons and you see the connections between mm. them. Mm. So it's a realistic drawing of, yeah. what, uh, yeah. of a portion of the brain. Yeah. So I arrived late, but uh, <laughs> what happened to you? Did you sleep well or not? No. No. Did you wake up in the middle of the night, perhaps? This is, this is the question to the use question. at the beginning to everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the answer to that? The, there is no one answer to that. It's mm. a way of, of connecting immediately with someone mm. at a very uh, fundamental level. But you yeah. said you had such a nice answer this morning. When I said, did you sleep well? I don't know. 
Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, because he was asleep. <laughs> because it depends. It, it depends. Well, actually, <laughs> when we are asleep, as you see, we are very, very active. Yes. So sleeping does not mean to turn off the brain, but actually it means to turn on the default mode network, which is super active when we turn off. So we turn off and this network, which is a very large scale network, turns on. And it's the place, let's say, where we dream, so the, we imagine, we have hallucinations. Mm -hmm. And in the wake state, we can daydream, we can make associations, we can let our mind wander. Mind wandering might feel like a distraction, but it can be both spontaneous, and in that case it's detrimental to creativity, but it can also be um, controlled mind wandering and in that case is very very useful of course if it works too much during the night then we wake up in the middle of the night and the second question is suppose you're working to build a railway in vermont it's the middle of the 19th century and your task is to blow up that uh, rock that is impeding the construction of the railway and you're pressing on the explosive, um, but you're pressing too much. At a certain point, it, it blows up, and this iron bar goes through your skull, comes in here behind your the left eye, and comes out of your skull. What happens to you after that? <laughs> I would, I would just die from the. You would just die. Of, Everybody would, would just, just die. I'd just die, except but, for <laughs> Phineas Gage, ah. who survived this experience. Okay. And he did not even, I mean, he fell down, of course, but uh, he was pulled up. He did not uh, lose conscience at all. He went home, survived, and kept on living a normal life. Was it really normal? No, he had changed. His personality had changed. Oh. He was not able to have normal social relationships anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is the start of the study of the other large-scale network you've heard this morning, the executive control network, which controls our thinking, metacognition, uh, starts activities and inhibits the uh, excitation of certain patterns. It's the home of social cognition, so we can inhibit things that normally would not be accepted in society, thanks to the executive control network. If it does not work, then we start behaving in a crazy way. These two large-scale networks, default mode network, executive control network, normally work in opposition. One goes up, the other one goes down. In creativity, they cooperate. So this is a thing that we have found very recently. Creative thinking requires both the imagination provided by the default mode network and at the same time, the control given by the executive control network. So the ultimate performance is a balance between imagination and control. If it's just imagination, then you are going out, but you are not able to extract the value. If, it, if you're too much controlled, there's no fantasy coming in. So let's move away from neuroscience now. Let's go up one level and uh, Think of when you learn something, the first time you learn uh, to drive, for example, or you learn to, to play a certain piece of music, you have to go note by note on the score and you have to think, where should my hand go? And of course, you're not playing at that time. You have to keep rehearsing until you don't think about it anymore and your hands just move and then you can start interpreting the music. What has happened is that uh, the neurons and the synapses that are involved in that task have uh, thresholds that are dynamic and the more you go through that pattern of activation, the lower these thresholds become. They become lower and lower, which means that you spend less and less energy to perform that task. And all of the brain performance is uh, geared towards minimization of energy expenditure. So we try to spend the minimum amount of energy that allows us to survive. Which means that essentially we are, as we learn and we become experts, we build or excavate these canyons in our brain 
and the normal operation, the brilliant, intelligent, respected operation is to remain at the bottom of the canyon so that when you get that input, water flows very, very quickly with uh, very little resistance and you are the expert and people admire you and you are good. But to be creative, you have to stop this flow of water, go back up to the surface and excavate new canyons, which means much slower, much more energy than the minimum that would be necessary for survival, much more energy than the minimum that would uh, mean to remain in the comfort zone where everybody likes you mm -hmm. and everybody understands what you're saying because you're going along with their expectations and you don't really know what's going to happen. It's a risk. You have to take a risk. All these elements are fundamental for creative thinking. So let's do this exercise in which you have to read the sentences that are coming up. As soon as you're ready, let's read together. Le groupe what, can we say what, what, what language is this? Well, we'll just read just, it. Just read. Yeah. Le groupe El, West, El group West is, is magnificent. magnificent. Yes, French. And Vinca yeah. and uh, super red. Vinca and Tony are super Sup super bright. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Hmm. So we can read this. But there's a but. So we are able to recognize inputs which has have a distance between what they are showing us and what exists and our reaction is to try to map and interpret these inputs according to what we already knew. And the more these inputs are close to us, our first names mis misspelled, the stronger the attraction. The more we are experts in a certain field, the more we tend to recognize in advance everything that comes to us as something that we already know. It's really funny because I couldn't recognize Minka. You couldn't recognize yourself. That's, that's <laughs> that great. That really strange. <laughs> we'll talk about this later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Without that, it would be impossible to recognize any handwriting mm -hmm. and it would be impossible yeah. to, to live. However, it's a double-edged sword because that also means that we are unable to notice real novelties. Mm. Something might be coming to us, mm. extremely new and surprising, but we tend to recognize it for something that already existed. Mm. Mm. And the more we are experts in a field, the more we fall into this trap. Mm. Yeah. Without yeah. expertise, you're not yeah. able to be an excellent screenwriter, for example, but at the same time, that expertise is also a trap. It's also a canyon. So you have to both be an expert and be ready to challenge yourself and be ready to notice those changes that are coming to you. This is the so-called standard definition of creativity, which, as you see, defines creativity as two requirements. So instead of saying what it is, we say what is needed to have creativity. And what is needed is both originality but that is not enough. Not everything that is original is creative because you can be original but totally nonsense. It's not difficult to be original but uh, you're out of the world, out of society. You also need the value, the effectiveness which depends on the domain. So if it's arts, the effectiveness will be an aesthetic value. If it's engineering, it might be performance and so on. But what is originality? Let's talk about that. Three elements in originality. Uh, originality means three things. First of all, novelty. Something cannot be original if it's not new. But it's not sufficient. Something can be new and not original. In order for something to be original, you also need surprise, which means out of expectation. So not only it's new, but I didn't expect that. It's surprising. And the US Patent Office has three criteria for awarding a patent. And one of them is non-obviousness. You do not receive a patent for an invention, which is an obvious extension of a previous patent. You need surprise. And the third element is authenticity. 
something original is authentic. It carries the signature of the mind or the minds that generated that idea. You can recognize a certain style in that original production. Is it really true that we need both originality and effectiveness in order to have creativity? Or can we have creativity? Can we be creative without recognition of originality and effectiveness? What do you think? Uh, depends on what you mean with effectiveness, at least. Let's say aesthetic value or appropriateness, value, meaningfulness. Is that effectiveness? I, the I have, logical answer would be no. I would say, yeah, but you know, I think creativity and laziness mm -hmm. goes really well together. Uh, I would, yeah, I would yeah, say. Yeah, sure. And yeah. I would say we always talk about being original is kind of a contemporary, relatively contemporary, you know, thing that just, I mean, kills us all it's in all, the end. Yeah. That would be my initial, my impulsive re it's response. Also one thing that will prevent you from writing is to think, I must be original. Mm. You'll screw yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. it won't happen, it's, it's it won't just... happen. And, oh, and probably the same, uh, I must be effective. You know, yeah. go home, yes, go yeah, home, it. it's not going to happen. Yeah. Hope, hope so, no. okay, so, so let's ask two, you, yeah. <laughs> how, does, how does this cope with your, right. your current definition of creativity? Right, this is contradicting that definition. Two elements. First of all, the search for original ideas and effective ideas that must be together. It's something that like uh, excavating in a mine and looking for gold. So it's a rare thing. There's no guarantee a priori. And the second element is who is to say what is original and what is effective? Mm. Who can be mm. the expert that tells us that? Nobody can, actually. So, we, have, we are full of examples in the history of the arts, science, technology, of uh, people that were very creative and nobody looked at them and nobody thought that their work was good. In science, for example, Hertz discovered that uh, it's true that uh, electromagnetic waves travel across even void, but it did not see any application. Mm. So the effectiveness, the value of that idea, which was dramatic, was invisible to him. So that means that uh, the game of creativity is a dynamic game. Nobody can give you an absolute score of creativity. So it's a potential originality, potential effectiveness. Sometimes that potential is realized. We have creative achievement. We go back to the standard definition. Sometimes that potential remains, you know, latent. That does not mean we're not creative. Actually, it's a very, very important part of the process. We call that creative inconclusiveness. It might be the most important part of the process. Mm. When you're in that state in which you have not yet found what you're looking for, or you did find it, but the people around you, the world around you does not recognize it. So what you do in that state is critical to the entire process. And this is an example of the non finito work by Michelangelo. Michelangelo did not finish most of his work. Leonardo did not finish most of his work. And that is a very, very important part of the process. I'm going to go quickly to the Da Vinci model, uh, which is our model. It's called Da Vinci because that becomes an, acro an acronym that uh, tells you the five mental states that are important in the creative process. Let's start from the beginning, the drive. Drive means you need to spend more energy than the minimum required to survive. You have to spend more energy than the minimum required to write a script according to what everybody else expects. And that drive has two elements, a, a cognitive part of the attention and the ability to change the point of view, to see that same problem from many, many different points of view. So attention flexibility. And the volition, DAV, at the area of attention and volition, is the motivational part. So you need to decide to invest your energy, time, reputation in that venture. It's a risk. The I stands for information. So you want to write the script. What information do you have? What ideas do you have? What was asked 
from uh, the director. So all of this we call relevant information, but it's allowed on the right side to add something that is a priori irrelevant. We call that inspiration. Inspiration is fundamental to create a mental state that we call the platform that should be outside of the common knowledge. If you're able to bring your mind into a state that you have never experienced before, and perhaps nobody else in the human race has ever experienced before, then your potential to generate something that has high potential for originality is very, very high. The key is the starting point. If you're able to create this starting point, which is completely unknown, and the consequences of which are completely invisible to you, your potential is very high. So then you get into this novelty generation uh, state, which you can use convergent divergent modalities, and the C is the creativity estimation, the extraction of value, which again can be convergent and divergent. It's a little too long, so but uh, let me give you an example of uh, use of information which a priori is irrelevant. This is a classic test that we use to measure divergent thinking. You give to the person participating a common object, like a coat hanger in the center, and you ask them to say original uses, alternative uses of that object. In this experiment, we put some distractors around them, the center, and we use the night tracking machine to see where the person is looking at. So the first five rows that you see here, openness, conscientiousness, extraversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism are the big five elements of personality. Number six and seven, the time, the amount of time the person was looking at the center, so it was focused on the task. And seven, the amount of time I was wasted looking at the outside ring. And the important result that I want to show you is uh, here the crossing of column eight and row 11. This uh, very high significant correlation of 0.5 between the amount of time that we spend letting information which a priori seems irrelevant in and creative success in our lives. So creative people, people that have creative success, have this habit of letting information in, and this is related to the openness personality characteristic. So we go from having an open attitude towards life, towards information, towards inputs, to creativity via the processing of inspiration, of irrelevant information. That is the key. And when we extract the value, this is a very dangerous zone because the more an idea is creative, the easier it is to throw it away. And we normally throw away most of our original ideas. There are four categories of judgment, depending on these two axes. One goes from categorical to propulsive. There is a kind of judgment which ends the process mm -hmm. and puts the idea into a category. Good, bad, doable, unfeasible, categorical judgment. On the opposite side, there is a form of judgment that gives more energy. It's propulsive. It's an interaction in which the idea is, and the process does not end, but the idea is evolved. It's called propulsive evaluation or estimation. On the vertical side, you have the time domain. So when you cross these two dimensions, you get these four quadrants. And on the bottom left here, you have the impulsive reaction. I think of something and I throw it away right away. Immediate categorical judgment. Or you produce an idea, first idea of a, of a script, uh, upper left, and you give it to somebody to be judged. And yes, yes, we invest on that or no, we don't. So you can keep reworking ideas for as long as you have time and the resources to invest. And this can happen also across centuries. So for example, to close, Leonardo da Vinci, most of his ideas did not find any estimators at the time that he lived and only found realization centuries afterwards. 
Just to give you examples, invention of the helicopter, principle, invention 400 years in advance, invention of the tank, invention of the contact lens, invention of the scuba diving apparatus, everything that he draw, drew back in the 1500 happened many, many centuries later. Okay, thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> what would he say about originality? Leonardo. Yeah. Well, was that concept really invented at that time? I would say so, yeah, I don't know if it was the, in the same terms. Uh, the term creativity comes later, actually. So yeah. Although the verb to create is, uh, it comes from Latin yeah, yeah. and before, yeah. but uh, creativity. But uh, for, for uh, Leonardo, most of the originality comes from using nature as a metaphor. So the source of originality in all Leonardo da Vinci's ideas is to take the principles, the observation, the feeling that he has and the understanding that he has of nature and transferring that to painting, mm. to design of machines. Mm. And this is another element of extracting the value from the ideas, which is non-obvious. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So extracting the value is never obvious. If the value is obvious, that means that the idea is not very original because we know. But when it's very original, then people will say, no, it's not good, no, it does not work, no, we've seen it before, and you have to fight. So originality is a fight in the end. You have to fight for it. Yeah. We talk a lot about being inspired and being in a trance and all kinds of other things, very exciting. So we both clearly need to be able to find a way of assessing and judging work, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think all the quadrants have their importance mm -hmm. because sometimes you need to decide and move on. It's important to understand that diagram and it's important to establish moments in time in which we work in another way. We work in a propulsive way. And therefore, all the inputs that you receive in a team or uh, in a collaboration, you're uh, Objective is not to say this is good or a bad idea, but where can I take that to? How can I develop that? What does that inspire me? Mm -hmm. And how can I take your idea and develop it further? Mm -hmm. And a game starts between two or more people to go as far as possible mm -hmm. and in many, many different directions. So that is the propulsive part, which can happen in real time. Of course, that is very important when we improvise. Mm -hmm. There's no time to think. But of course, from the point of view of a, of a writer, in which we have time, then it's the elaborate, propulsive, dynamic estimation which is crucial. Which means you work on something, you can let it rest for some time, don't think about it, take it back, maybe it's the work from somebody else, see where that goes, what is the inspiration, how can we build it together, and there is no hierarchy. There is no chief or executor, that Everyone is at the same level and everybody can uh, contribute. The problem, of course, in the real world is that we're not in control of all of these uh, different areas, you know. Um, there are plenty of people involved in the world of filmmaking who would have, they would not have the first notion of what you're talking about and wouldn't understand it or be interested in it. Let's say that the, the kind of quadrant which is most used is the categorical immediate. So people tend to judge immediately and uh, say yes or no, and most of the times they may say no, unless you're following the mainstream. Mm -hmm. but that's not what we're here for. Right? I mean, if take an example that we know very well when you're on the set shooting a film, you only have very little time, and the thing, the moment where you have to decide if a take is good enough or we want to make another one. This is a this is a typical example where you have to take a quick, is this good enough? Yes or no? We need to know it now because we can't waste time discussing it. If we stay, it will be really expensive, <laughs> you know? So it, and then you may have to cut down on something else in order to, you know, so it also have huge, it has huge creative implications, but also economic implications. Uh, and, and I think that what was interesting with this diagram, or what you call it, is that, uh, is that it shows us 
makes us more aware of when we are where. <laughs> what you say is exactly um, testifying the fact that all of the quadrants are important. Yeah. In that condition, to, to waste time is not an option mm. and to make a, a wrong decision has a, a huge cost. Mm. So you need immediate categorical decisions. Mm. In that case, that mm. is what you need to do. Mm. But uh, there are other moments in which that same attitude is very detrimental. Mm. So mm. it's important, as you say, to be aware of the different mm. typologies. Mm. Mm. So, so what, what would you say was kind of... Do you see a line between feedback and assessment? First of all, assessment can be internal. Mm. Feedback normally requires at least two actors, but assessment goes on within every one of us. Ah. As we are writing, we might be falling into those traps, or yeah. if we know that we give ourselves some time, yeah. we might behave differently. So assessment can be also individual. Yeah. The feedback normally involves uh, somebody else, an audience feeding back. Okay. The feedback might be, in a sense, uh, objective, but the purpose of assessment or estimation is to try to extract the maximum value from what you receive. It's an active performance. Whenever you have something truly creative, which is new and surprising and authentic, the value is not obvious. So if somebody engages and is able to see the value, perhaps where nobody else sees it, mm. that's the highest possible contribution you can give. Mm. Everybody else say, say this is uh, not good, but you see and you understand why it's good and you're able to lead everyone else onto that. That is the highest activity in terms of creativity estimation. We talked about the big tragedy that so many young filmmakers make their first and last movie at the same time. Mm. And, uh, and at least in, in some societies, it has to do with the way funding works. That if you are a decision maker, everybody wants to do what you said right now. <laughs> so it's kind of the, considered the kind of the fi my finest hour when I discovered this young talent who had novelty and uh, originality and all that. And it's like the dream of doing that will make them kind of, you know... It's, I think it's e an egotistical yeah. need to at for executives to attach themselves to talent. Yeah. And so the discovery of new blood is everything to them. Yeah. And they're less interested in, for example, uh, continuing to uh, develop and, and finance and mm. fund, um, you know, someone's development as an artist. Mm. This makes me think of the fact that it's important to fail early and it's much more dangerous to succeed early. This is the reason, I mean, the reason for that is that when you succeed immediately, you have no time for refinement, you have no real wall to overcome or obstacles to overcome and people start expecting from you to repeat what you've done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you fail, then you have many lessons to learn. Mm. And if you persist, of course, you need to persist. You can elaborate your style and your ideas. Mm. And if you think of the people that really had made a difference in the arts, science and technology, they have a long history of failures before succeeding. And the people that succeed immediately, they don't go anywhere. When you talked about the, you know, your three markers of the original, which yes. is new and surprise. And you mentioned authenticity, and I wondered if you could talk about authenticity and what, what you meant by that, really. If an idea is rooted within yourself, your values, your experience, your memories, then what comes out is, uh, has a much higher personal value. Mm -hmm. And since we all have different lives, mm -hmm. there are no two people alike, no two people have the same experiences, and if, even if they have the same experiences, they don't live it in the same way. They all interpret the same experience in a different way. Then that idea has a very high potential for being original. As opposed to somebody who is just trying to follow fashion mm -hmm. trends, so it's not true to her or his own values, so it's not authentic, then the potential for originality of that idea is very low. So. The, Authenticity is a, an element of originality, which is important in terms of uh, being true to your own ideas, in a sense. And could, could it also be true to your 
response to the outside world. The important thing is that you try to interact with that other group or try to understand what they are thinking, what they are feeling. And perhaps it's not true in the sense that you're not in their minds, no. but it's your true experience of their own life. And you write about that. And that becomes credible, that becomes authentic. So authenticity is really a personal, very personal element of originality. Originality cannot be transferred from one person to another. I'm sitting thinking about this authenticity definition. What was that concept of authenticity? Because authenticity is something, you know, you can't, because you can't question it. I feel like questioning it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and also, can I just throw in two strange examples of this, perhaps? One is, you know, this movie Man of Aaron? Mm -hmm. So this, so Man of Aaron, which was made, I don't know when it was made, uh, 1920, 30, something like this, on the Aran Islands, and it's it's um, it's a, like it's a documentary of a man existing in a very rocky place, and he grows potatoes in these rocks. It's all invented, mm. but it's done with a kind of it's sold to you as a documentary. It was believed to be a documentary and a way and a record a record of a certain kind of life, and it was it was all invented. Of course, to be authentic does not mean to say the truth. You might be authentic in inventing the story, which has no connection to reality, but it's something that represents you. The authenticity, it's more related to the, to the style, to your fingerprint, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's the fingerprint of the creator mm -hmm. on the creation. That is the authenticity mm -hmm. part. So if you're able to put your fingerprint on what you do, then people will recognize Yes, that's an original work by mm. Tony, by Vinka. Mm. It's a fingerprint. Mm. That is what I'm talking about. But you can put a fingerprint on a total invention that has no connection to reality. Okay. Okay. And how do you, and with a collaborative art form like film, how would you, how do you think of that course, would? Uh, it becomes multidimensional, but still that group working together is producing something that no other group could do in the mm. same way. So there is a collective fingerprint, if mm. you will. I was wondering, like, uh, you have this expertise, when you grow expertise, it's by doing the same thing. Right. I suppose it's about walking in the canyon. So many times you actually dig, you know. Right. I was so happy when finally, you know, the activity moved to a place in my brain. So that gave me kind of a feeling of an overview. So definitely over the years, the. The, my, the way I look at these things have changed. So how do you relate that thing with the overview to the, to the canyon thing that you have to get out of? Okay, uh, of course the, the way the brain works is still mysterious in some way. We know many things, but there's much more that we don't know. But for sure there is a hierarchy of functionalities so what you're talking about now is you take an abstract view of things that you know by detail mm. and you have a different feeling and you like it and so on. But even that abstract view, in a way, is a, an anticipation of what you would do in the details. Mm. So the feeling of knowing, the feeling of understanding, the feeling of coherence about the knowledge that you have is, in a sense, an abstract representation of the details. Mm. And we are able to do that. We are also perhaps the only animal that can do that. Uh, so much so that uh, we are able to anticipate what will come next. And we only activate those regions in the brain that will be later involved. And that's another way to save energy. Mm -hmm. So we don't activate all of the regions in the brain. We just expect what will come later in an abstract way because we have the overview. Mm -hmm. We have experience. We know we'll, what will come. This is great, fantastic, mm. but if something unexpected comes in, we are blind to that mm. because of this anticipation. So, in a sense, uh, it's always the same game of trying to yeah. be alert, sensitive to changes, humble, because if you're humble, then you don't assume that you know everything mm. that will happen next. Mm. You need to keep that level of um, humbleness throughout your life mm. in order to to continue to surprise yourself and the others. Mm -hmm. I have this question about the question. Ah, the meta question. 
Yes. Yeah. What is your big question in your research? Mm. What is your burning question? What drives you in your research mm. of this creativity thing? Right now, um, I'm talking about creativity all the time, of course, mm. and it looks like creativity is everything, but creativity is not everything. We need both intelligence, we call it intelligence, of course it can be explained in different ways, and creativity. So the big question is, what is the optimal balance, for mm. example, in an education system? Mm. Right now it's totally focused on knowledge and competence, mm. and therefore things that you can measure through an IQ test, in the end it's intelligence. Mm and very, very little room for creativity, perhaps with little arts and so on. So now it's totally uh, unbalanced in favor of intelligence, let's say. But even if it was, everything was creative, that would not be good because you need, as you need sometimes to take fast, quick decisions in filmmaking, you need fast and quick decisions in your life. Mm -hmm. So if you only teach creativity, that is not good either. So what is the optimal balance between intelligence and creativity in education, in development, in the business, in the filmmaking business, for example? And um, that is leading us to, to work on uh, the level of constraints that we have in time. So how much pressure do we have to get results as opposed to how much time do we have to develop a new idea? So that is what we're mm. working on right now. Mm. 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 The hanger. The hanger. The, the, the hanger. The hanger is no. It's the, the hanger is a story. The hanger is when you showed your slide of the hanger. Oh, that's right. I looked at the hanger and I, and uh, I immediately panicked from with anxiety because <laughs> here comes a test. I was amused by because it, it was it was uh, I think one of the really pleasurable things about okay, your but talk. If you were a soldier, how would you use the hanger? If I was a soldier, yes. I immediately would undo the hanger to use it as a piece of wire for something. Piece of wire, for example, mm. to mm. escape from. How how would you use the wire? You're a, a soldier in World War Two. How would you use that wire? I, am I imprisoned? Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put it through the door and move. move and the now latch. immediately you're in the desert. How do you use the hanger? I'm using it in the desert. I'm going to attach it to some pot or something to. Uh, I think I'm going to use it to put it into the ground to get some water out. Or maybe I'll find, use the hangers to make, uh, collect yes, moisture in some way. to find the water. And the rocket is taking you to Mars. Yes. And you will end on Mars. And how do you use the coat I, hanger? I right need now? the coat hanger because I need to hang my spacesuit somewhere. Space, the spacesuit <laughs> must be somewhere. And, and, we can, and we can go on forever. There are, there are infinite ways to use the coat hanger. For sure. We can go on for, there's for no sure. limit. For sure. There's no limit to the number of alternatives. I, and we live in a very, very limited space of concepts. Yes. But there is no limit to the alternatives. And you've just tried it. Oh, so the test has come. The test came and went. I, I think I, what's great about, one of the great things about your talk is that you enjoy games and you understand about play. Mm. Well, which play. is uh, everything. Huh? Play is everything. Mm. And it has a root. Uh, when we were hominids, we first of all started to be uh, bipedalism, so we started to stand up, to be erect, and uh, we started to use our hands for something different than from standing on our ground or grabbing branches. That made our brain grow and our skull grow, so it became more and more difficult to give birth to children, so I'm talking about uh, 15 million years ago now and then. So that means that uh, our babies came out earlier and earlier, mm. and that means they are not ready. We were mm. talking about uh, the brain not being ready. Mm -hmm. That leads to neoteny. Neoteny is a characteristic not only of human beings, but uh, mainly for human beings. That means to maintain the characteristic of a child even in the adult age, neoteny. It's something which is studied at biological level. And that means play for years, play with ideas, play with music, proto-sound and sound, proto-language and language. Everything happens between the mother and the child mm -hmm. as the father is outside looking for food I and mean, it has nothing to do with that. Okay, so playing is fundamental for our development of our species mm -hmm. and it's not due to the male part of the family. No. 
You know, it was the mother and the child. They, they developed language and everything else by playing. How do you know that? It, well, that's part of this uh, creativity theory. Where does it start from? Okay. Yeah. And even, so the ontological it, part. And even, it's, 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 because it's, it's a beautiful story, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a story. It's yeah, a story, but, yes. but it's just as when you see animals, uh, small baby animals, they play as well. But you're talking so about so There are some more. animals that don't play. Like, There's yeah. one turtle, it's a kind of a turtle in, uh, in Australia, <laughs> and remains in the egg for one year or more. And when it comes out of the egg, there is nobody around. There's no, and so it just starts to live yeah. without playing. It never yeah. plays. And that's it sounds like a that's child's terrible. story. The turtle who never played. Mm. But I'm, I've, I've never... <laughs> a so tragedy. It has a, no, it has a happy <laughs> ending. He, he finds another turtle. Huh? After 50 years. After 50 years, yeah. <laughs> and then they have little turtles. And they play with them this time. <laughs> and that's <laughs> and <laughs> We can set it to Disney after this. We can all copyright this together. Um, but I'd never heard of this. Is this new to you as well? Not any? I, I've never, I've never. I, I heard I, the part about the birth, I, but, the, but, but why it shouldn't but be the children play. playing with each other or the the children going with the dad and I mean... No, no, the need to continue playing because of being born too soon, as it were. And so the need to continue to play because it's that's how you d you're developing. So you say when dogs, it's the same because dogs are also born a little bit too, too early, earlier than the turtle. So, so play is not only for humans, of course. No. But we have the longest period yeah. of uh, childhood yeah. as opposed to other yeah. species. Other species, after three days, they run away. Mm. We take one year just to make the first yeah. few steps. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very slow. We are the slowest on Earth, yeah. absolutely the slowest. Yeah. And somehow this is an advantage. Mm. And remember that creativity is slow thinking mm. and not fast thinking. Mm. We are able to abstract. We are able to look at the things from an overview level. And all the other animals are just project-based learning. They mm. only learn what they experience on themselves directly. Mm. We learn vicariously. Mm. We learn without having experienced. Mm. And that changes everything mm. because we are, in only 20 years of schools and university, we bring everyone to the level of 160,000 mm. years of evolution mm. of the mm. Homo sapiens. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that's due to our language, memory, our ability to understand without trying out mm. Mm. in an abstract way. Mm. Mm. That's why we are so strong. Mm. Should we? In conclusion. In conclusion. Yeah. There's no conclusion. We shouldn't come to a conclusion. No. Can't no. It's an open-ended problem yeah. Yeah. and discussion. But, um, and, it, and it goes on into the future. I hope, yeah. If yeah. we can have one as a species. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see I hope tomorrow. That we can. Does, is that, is Let's that, see uh, in half an hour. That's where we need the creativity, I guess. <laughs> yeah. We need the, the bright side of creativity. Mm. Because, of course, there's also the dark side of creativity. Mm -hmm. We need transformation of creativity for the better of humanity. That was a great conclusion. Conclusion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <it> was. <laughs> Let's go then. <laughs>